Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafiroff. This show is designed to highlight the work of philanthropic leaders here in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, Tom Edmonds. Tom is the Executive Director of the Southampton Historical Museum. Tom, welcome to Successful Philanthropy, and it is so nice to have you here. And Tom, I want to start with you a little bit. I understand you've been Executive Director for 15 years. This must be a labor of love, correct? I, it is. Uh, it's something I always wanted to do since I was a kid. I started out being an artist, but I found I was spending all my time in museums. So when I was wondering how to make a living, I went to the library and found that museums was an occupation. People actually work in museums. I just <laughs> used to go and look at the pretty pictures, but uh, it became a career, and uh, that happened about 35 years ago. You first started in museums 35 years ago. I, I uh, was at NYU's postgraduate uh, department of museum studies, and what's great about NYU is that it's taught by professionals. The professors actually are working professionals, and uh, I worked with great exhibition designers and got to go behind the scenes of the Whitney, the Natural History of Museum, and uh, it was an amazing opportunity where you'd have to do everything. And uh, I wanted to be a curator, so I got, they got me a job. NYU got me a job in Pennsylvania, a very small historical society, where I learned everything. That in the museum world, you have to design exhibits and take out the trash at the same time. So it was an eye-opening experience for somebody in their early 30s. Uh, but uh, I, I've had a fun. I've had fun for 35 years. And Southampton History Museum is you know, is the best, it's my shining glory, I think, in my career. You really love working for the museum, and, and you've done a lot for the museum, and for our audience, explain a little bit exactly what the museum is. Uh, the museum, I think you'll be surprised in my answer, is people, and it's people like you. Uh, Jean, you've been a supporter of our museum, and not just financial, but you've done a lot of publicity for us, but the community of Southampton really makes my job worthy, it, it fulfills me. And um, I'll, you know, there was a recent uh, Fourth of July parade where uh, I walk around and talk to everybody, some people I know, I meet new people, and um, I get such a great feeling and uh, a support. Uh, people love what I'm doing and, and I have a mission behind what I'm doing. So. But the museum, what do you really do? What is the museum about? I understand it was founded in 1898 and then became incorporated in 1910. And so what exactly is in the museum? I'm so delighted you know that. So few <laughs> people do. Uh, I yeah, did my homework. You did. Uh, we're the third oldest uh, history museum on Long Island. The first is the Brooklyn Historical Society. Second is Suffolk County, and we're the third oldest. And uh, it was formed by women, um, which most people don't think of, museums, but 70% uh, uh, of our original founding members uh, were women. And they weren't just wives of somebody else. They, were, they took out individual membership. So Southampton uh, history is interesting because the resort section that came in the 1870s uh, Lots of people were coming out to get healthy, and Southampton women actually made the community that it is now. So they founded, they helped uh, Sam Parrish with the Parrish Art Museum. The women uh, started the Southampton Hospital, um, and the Meadow Club and all the arts organizations. Uh, women formed the first plein air or outdoor art uh, school with William uh, Merritt Chase. Uh, in Art Village in Southampton, and that was all, all, all women did it. And why? It's because men were, stayed behind in Manhattan uh, making a living, and women were, were out here pursuing their, their love, and that was families, how to entertain families. The, the children and playing tennis and swimming in the ocean uh, was very important. So, uh, and then they got involved in community. And they got in community. community. Uh, you're involved with the Southampton Hospital. I have yeah. great photographs of women on Job's Lane and booths. They're selling things. They're selling things out of their attic. 
or whatever, but women steered uh, the Southampton Hospital fundraisers, like you do now, right? Well, thank you. <laughs> yes, we try. I'm on the board of the Stony Brook Southampton Hospital. It's called the Southampton Hospital Association, and yes, I love working uh, as a board member and as a former chair of their big gala. I've done that three times, but we're here to talk about the Southampton Historical Museum. And tell me, have you ever done and this may be an idea for an exhibit all about the women behind the community. I'm glad you brought that out because uh, uh, right now we have a temporary exhibit uh, on women who changed Southampton. And there's 12 women who are basically from the Southampton's Gilded Age who funded a lot of projects and did a lot of things. And uh, we had to close it to the public during COVID but we've created a Zoom lecture on each of those women and um, you know how we were affected by COVID. We, learned, we went electronic. And so each of these 12 women had a Zoom lecture dedicated to them. And one of those uh, Zoom lectures now has over 50,000 visitors. So wow. when we used to have, uh, we would have had an on-site uh, lecture with Mary Cummings or somebody else on staff giving a lecture. Now, we would have gotten 30, 40 people, 50,000. Now that you've gone virtual. Yes. So let's talk about what the Southampton Historical Museum did during the pandemic and how are you chronicling the pandemic? You have records of the 1917 pandemic at the Historical Museum. I've read about them, it's all very interesting and very informative and also very educational and helpful. So what are you doing or what did you do during the pandemic uh, to chronicle it? Well, first we panicked. We, I had an anxiety attack and didn't know what to do, but I came out of that uh, with the realization that yes, we had to record today. What was gonna happen today? How should people 100 years from now know about that and just like you said we have records from the influenza pandemic of uh, 1918 and uh, so we have photographs of that and uh, there was actually a house out in North Sea Road for influenza people to isolate themselves and so we know where that house is and it's gone now but people had hardships just they had to stay indoors people that had influenza had to be isolated just like we did in, during COVID and uh, uh, so we immediately started a COVID diary. And it was a journal writing uh, group of people who got together once a week to write down their experiences in, beginning in March of 2020, when, we, when everybody shut down, uh, shut down in March 23rd. Uh, so we started that and, um, and it's preserved forever. So you can go to our YouTube channel and uh, see, see uh, the, uh, the uh, COVID diaries and all of our other lectures that, I'm, that we do, so. And did you do a photography exhibit? Well, we have, you know, probably 10,000 historic photographs. So uh, the women who uh, influenced Southampton, we have old photographs of, of what they did, where they lived, what were their activities. Uh, the funniest uh, photograph we have is people swimming not actually swimming in the ocean, but people used to go in full clothing to go bathing, and they'd have a little cabana on wheels that a horse would let, you know, bring to the beach, and then they would go out. They wouldn't swim. They would hold on to a rope. I don't think people knew how to swim. So instead of swimming, because they had lots of wool swimwear, mm -hmm. they would hold on to like a rope tow at a ski at a ski resort and you know, drag themselves out and then drag themselves back to just, just to get wet. And then they had to go into this little cabana to ch take off their wet clothes and put on a lot more because in 1910, everybody wore lots of clothes, so. And what about the current pandemic? Are you doing anything in the way of photography to chronicle it? I'm not really. Um, I'm, there is so much already on, uh, el available electronically on the internet. Sure. And you know I, we're a small organization. We're we're very small, um, so we we can't go out and record things, and we never have. We we depend on donations. Uh, I I'm I'm looking for photographs. I want photo albums. What's really important now to me is to document uh, the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, 
uh, there was a great change in Southampton in 1970. And so pre-1970 and post-1970 is very important. And what was the change in 1970 that you're referring to? The Long Island Expressway. Interesting. It, and it brought many more people it, out to the They Hamptons. were developing it uh, in, in the uh, 1960s, and then it stopped in Riverhead in 1970. And uh, housing development, uh, people who lived mid-island came out to Southampton to build summer homes. So there were small housing developments of by school teachers and people who could come out here just to... Uh, Get, get away, but it, it wasn't all people from Manhattan, although, of course, that was an important element. But uh, there was a lot of housing development here at post-1970. And after 1970, are you going to continue uh, with your chronicling, or are you going to do something else? Well, um, I don't think we're through with COVID yet, um, so we'll see what happens. Um, but but in, in the future, I want to have two kinds of exhibits. I want one that does a deep dive into our history, some unusual aspect that people don't think of, or mm -hmm. there's always new, new, uh, new ideas and, and new historical events that come to life that uh, will always look fresh. I mean, Southampton is 12,000 years old. 12,000 years ago, the Paleo-Indians came over from uh, Europe or Alaska. There's two theories of thought. And so we have a lot of uh, Native American uh, arrowheads and spears and things like that. So uh, we did an exhibit about 10 years ago on, on the Shinnecock uh, Nation that's out here. So we'll, it's probably about time to do it again. Um, so there's, there's, always, there's always new things from the past to bring up. So I think we can stay relevant like that. One fun exhibit we're having is uh, on people's pets. Oh, I like that. People have had <laughs> dogs and ponies and chickens as pets for a long time. We have a great collection of old photographs that show, uh, you know, there was a, there's a photograph of a woman hugging a cow. She's, you know, most people on, in Southampton had a cow in their backyard. People don't think of that. You needed fresh milk, and fresh milk was available if you, all you had to do was put a, keep a cow in your backyard so you could go out in the morning and have fresh milk. So I've and got this great And what period was that when... Women and oh. or families had cows in the backyard. At, you know, three, four hundred years ago, when cows first came over here, and uh, everybody had a cow. It was just like everybody has a refrigerator. You want fresh food, so it stopped. It stopped late here. Uh, I know a woman on our board who ha grew up with a cow in her backyard, and we're talking about the 1930s and 1940s. So and now we have deer. We have lots ducks. of deer. <laughs> And we all have our dogs and our cats. We have five rescue dogs. Wow. Which is wonderful. They bring a lot of love into our family. Will you be in our show? Uh, I, if you ask I me, want, I will. I'm asking you because we always have a current element. We have the, you know, dogs and cats from the past. And I'd, love I'd to, be happy to. I'd love to have a shot of you in our exhibit. Sure. Now, I, I would love that. And I think it's so important to promote the importance of animals and the lives of different people and because the animals are our unspoken population that's or true. one of them and yeah. it's our responsibility to give them a voice at least that's what i believe and they're very much part of the history of the hamptons when you think of it because the hamptons was farms for years and we still have farms we have fewer farms but we all have pets I'm and they're I very much part of the culture of uh, the people. And I see East Hampton, South Hampton, Bridgehampton, Montauk, everyone has a pet. And we have the deer all over. And I know we love the deer. We're very, uh, we don't, we're not inviting them into the home, but we love to have them around. Um, and because they're very beautiful and they're God's people. Now getting back to the museum. You do so many interesting exhibits, and you have this very extensive library of 8,000 volumes, correct? Correct. That's a lot of volumes. So if someone really wants to do a thorough history of the Hamptons, they go to the Southampton Historical Museum. Yes? Uh, I, our, uh, what I'm proudest of is our primary documents. We have maps and deeds that go back to the 17th century. Uh, we have family oral histories that haven't been published, diaries, ledgers, uh, businesses. So 
it, it's actually our archive that is the heart of the museum. But books are, we also have books. I was just going through our books um, and was surprised to find information that I can't find on the internet. That's one thing I have to keep telling myself because I'm always <laughs> Googling everything. We all it's, are. It's not all on there. It's not, and uh, I, I just re was reminded uh, myself about our book collection. So yes, people uh, come to the museum, school kids come to the museums. To, uh, they're required, uh, the New York State curriculum requires you to work with primary documents, and primary documents are things that are not published, one of a kind, a whaling log. We have logs that were kept by uh, captains of uh, whaling ships, and they're, they, they have the names of people who were on their ship, and if anything, if a sailor lost an arm, that would, was requir required to be recorded. There's drawings of whales. There's, you know, if uh, somebody doing a log felt like doodling, it's there from 150 years ago. So interesting, really, the history of our Hampton community. And for our audience, we are with Tom Edmonds. He's the executive director of the Southampton Historical Museum. And we're getting a little information about the history of Southampton and then the entire community here, the Hamptons. And Tom, getting back to some of the history, I remember going into the museum when you have an exhibit on the great hurricane of 1938. And there are books on that. Now, to me, that was absolutely fascinating. And the water level, I think it actually came up to Main Street in Southampton. It did. My question is, was Main Street where it is today back in 1938, or was it closer to the ocean? Uh, Main Street, actually there's a section along Gin Lane that's underwater. And if you go from Gin Lane and you go out to the beach and you keep going into the water, uh, and if you have a pair of goggles on, you'll, you'll see a road with road posts. So in the 1750s, a whole section of Southampton was submerged during a, an earthquake. It's called the Cape, Cape Elizabeth, or Cape, no, I'm sorry, Cape Anne uh, earthquake of 1750. And uh, it went all, from Massachusetts all the way down to uh, New Jersey. And so there's a submerged section of Southampton. If, give, give me some fins and a Google and, a, and some goggles, Google goggles, uh, I would love to go record that because that's, Again, like I said before, that's unknown uh, history of Southampton that's just waiting to be rediscovered. So much waiting to be rediscovered. And I think people really do have a, an interest in the history of uh, this place. And the fact that you have a museum and then um, you chronicle everything and then um, well, you, you have a physical plant with all the little buildings. I mean, an old-fashioned home that's, is that Halsey House or is that? Halsey House is New York State's oldest wood frame house. And we just found that out about three years ago when there was another house that claimed to be older. Was, uh, it was uh, Dendrochronology was done on the house to find that it was actually younger than Halsey House. So uh, Halsey House was built in 1648. Uh, by by uh, Thomas Halsey, but to tie in what you were talking about, your love of animals, uh, Halsey House is located on almost an acre of ground, and what I noticed over the years were, were the amount of monarch butterflies that land there. So we've started developing our grounds to attract monarch butterflies, and uh, last last January, uh, Halsey House is now certified monarch, monarch butterfly sanctuary. Well, and, that's fascinating. And I saw my first butter, my first monarch butterfly uh, yesterday. So, uh, I'd like I haven't got a lot of time to be outside, and they've probably been here before. But as you know, monarchs are going to take over the beach uh, sometime in September on their way to Mexico. So, uh, we have a, we have a lot of land. So yes, we have historic buildings. We have four separate properties. We have fourteen historic buildings we manage, but. It's the land that's becoming much more poignant for us. Uh, COVID uh, made me realize that outdoors are important to people because everybody, everybody had to stay inside. And so our grounds became popular last summer for youth programs. Uh, we had youth, uh, we had high school, no, we had babies on our property 
every day of the week. Uh, we worked with Kathy Bishop uh, with the uh, Southampton Youth Task Force, and uh, we had, uh, what was it called? We had Families on Blankets, so uh, listening to high school students read from books. So it's adorable. There were, you know, family units socially isolated on their own blanket, listening to high school kids read from books. And uh, that was just a really feel good for me when I, when I saw that. Uh, we also work with uh, uh, two youth groups uh, who uh, focus on children with autism. Oh, and that's a wonderful thing. So, so two groups are coming. One group is coming to the Rogers Mansion to do art projects. Uh, younger autistic children and then uh, uh, high school autistic children are coming to Halsey House to paint it. So as I'm talking now, why, don't, why isn't that an exhibit? I, wouldn't you love to see uh, high school kids with special needs have, who always do great artwork? When I was in uh, New York City, I did an internship with disadvantaged children in, in the Bronx and they made the most fabulous stuff. I know, I think that would be a very nice opportunity for those children. Wouldn't it? Amazing. And so you do so many different things. I haven't and done that one yet. <laughs> and I, I know you also have, or you used to have, a lecture series. And I, you were kind enough to invite me to give a, a talk about a book, my book, Successful Philanthropy, How to Make a Life by What You Give. And that was a very special moment for me. And Many people came. I spoke about the importance of philanthropy as we're speaking about it now. And I want to just thank you. It was very, very nice Gina, for you to that, do that. Your book, your book is, is great. Um, it, it actually, you formalized a lot of things that were in my head. I also learned new things. And it, it's just never been in a, a handy book like that uh, to reference. And, and uh, you also remember Bob Schaliner was there. I do, the I, president of... Uh, Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, a Who's great a good friend, friend of yours. and a wonderful leader. Yeah. Yes. Now, if people want to get involved, do you have volunteer opportunities? Not yet. Not like we did uh, uh, pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, uh, uh, we had lots of activities going on, but we've ha we're staying very, very safe until this is over completely. And I'm I'm not sh really sure it is yet. But so we're I'm walking on tippy toe around volunteer activities but uh, we do have a thrift shop uh, mm -hmm. that's open Saturdays and Sundays and, and I love that place <laughs> and it, you've been there yes I have so so that's that's a lot of fun it's a, a, and it's an open barn like atmosphere so it's not like clo coming into a closed uh, room so it's 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 safe to come to but uh, that's a lot of fun and I'm so glad we do that it's another way for people to come in and enjoy the museum without having to go inside and if people want to donate, what is the website? SouthamptonHistory.org. Say it again. SouthamptonHistory.org. And they can go on the website, they can donate, and then they can also look at, for all your programs. And then you have fundraisers, I know that, and I know this summer and the summer of uh, 2021, you have some very special events coming along, and um, I think that's great. And I. I hope they continue throughout the year and then into next year because when you have a charity, it is vitally important to continue fundraising always and to engage the community as the Southampton Historical Museum has and as pretty much all charities do. So, Tom, do you want to talk a little bit about the types of things you do to fundraise or? Sure. Okay. I love fundraising, <laughs> like you do. <laughs> well, no, it's a necessity. It's, it's a necessity, work. but it's fun. I mean, you make it fun. You, you're, the many things that you do are, are always fun, and I know you work really hard. But Thank when you. it's showtime, you don't see that. <laughs> well, we try not to show that. I, I have the same problem, too. I have to, I have to make my sh shining face seen at uh, fundraisers, but it's not that hard because people are so nice. That's, that's what I love so about true. fundraisers. I mean... It's hard getting ready and it's hard planning and everything, but when you're there after that first two minutes of nervousness that I have. Well, and everybody's having a great time for a good cause. Yes, and yes. I almost find it's more fun to go to a fundraiser than to go to a private party because oh. you see a lot more people That's that you true. would never see and you're supporting a good cause. Yeah. And you feel like, I mean, here in the Hamptons, we're the playground of the rich and famous and 
every weekend there might be 10, 15, 20, maybe 50 parties. But if you can go to a party and support a good cause, well, it's a nice thing to do. And you meet new people. And that's what I love, because at some of the more uh, private parties, very often you're with the same group, correct? Right. And you go to a fundraiser, well, you never know who you're going to meet. And, and the surprise element, right? It's a it's surprise, that, which is so fun. We, we do fundraisers, but we also do community events that are free. Which is wonderful. And, and uh, before COVID, we, had, uh, uh, we would have a, a celebration of Americana in June, and the Sag Harbor Community Band would, would play uh, songs from the American Songbook. Uh, classic American music, and it was free, and people would come out. People who would wander onto our property didn't even know they were going there. They just would hear this great brass noise down the street. And so uh, that's why we do fundraisers, so we can do things like that where uh, people come in. And, and uh, I, w I was just at the uh, uh, inauguration of the new mayor of Southampton Village, and it was 120 people probably, and it was representative of everybody that lives in Southampton. There's, we're all kinds of people. We're very diverse. Very much so. Now, we have one minute left. What? One minute left. <laughs> Seems like three. <laughs> Quickly, what advice do you give to young people now uh, who might want to get involved with your museum, might want to study history? Uh, you can give advice that sure. may change that's their easy. careers. In internships. That's how I started out. I did internships at the Whitney and, um, like I said, the Natural History Museum. And we get internships, interns all the time. And I hired two of them. They're on my staff right now. And uh, I've got two, two young people this summer. Uh, actually, one is a return. And we paid him uh, on his return because he's so good. And it's, internships are the way to do it. Just start out. I like that. And then, of course, volunteering, which is so important. And I know your volunteer organization or your, 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 organize, your volunteer opportunities right near now are a little limited yeah. because of COVID. But They'll be back. I'm sure. Well, Tom, this has been a wonderful interview. And thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, and thanks for inviting me. We'll you. have you back. OK, thank you. And this concludes Successful Philanthropy. Today's guest, Tom Edmonds. He is the executive director of the Southampton History Museum. I'm Jean Shafroff, your host. I'll see you next week.